um, Graham's, Graham will introduce himself in more detail, but um, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's been working for the department forever, since day one. No. No? Uh, no, Quite. no. Oh, I suppose it was. Yeah. On, contra- on contract to start yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, so I, I'm Graham Elliott. I work for DOC. I'm, I'm a scientist with, I don't know what our science bit's called, science and capability, and I, I work in the threats bit. So we, um, and the threats bit looks at how to kill stuff, how to deal with the baddies. Um, but, I, but I've been interested in birds since I was 12, so 40-something years ago, so, so I've got a long background in birdie stuff. But more important for this is I did my PhD on yellowheads as they were then, now Mohor, up, up the Eglinton Valley, and, and then after that I worked on parakeets up there for, for ages. So I sort of spent about 10 summers up the Eglinton Valley, and that, that's when I got to know this neck of the woods the best. Um, since then I've worked on kākāpō and, and kia, and then I started working on the Operation Arc project, which some of you might remember, which was 11 sites around the South Island, beach forested sites, where we were trying to figure out how to do pest control to protect the beach forest birds, you know, the sort of the moho, the parakeets, the kākas, kiwis and fio. So that went on for a few years, and that sort of wound down a, a bit, but I'm still involved with that. But these days I'm working on, um, mainly working on 1080, and we're uh, trying to figure out... Um, whether there are benefits to forest birds from 1080 use and, um, and how you might improve the use of 1080 to get um, better benefits for forest birds out of its use. But anyway, what I'm going to talk about mostly is I'm just going to talk about sort of background to controlling pests in beech forests and um, I'll talk about some of the pitfalls and the things we've learned recently and then at the end I'll have a bit of a plug for trying to do this stuff on a big scale. But we'll start off with just talking about pests and beach forests. And I'm going to illustrate most of it with the moho, because he's the, he's the dicky bird I know the best. And it's also the one, it's, it's right on the cusp of, of heading for extinction. So it's one that's very sensitive to pests. So it's a great one to illustrate this kind of stuff with. So where's my zapper? Um, so moho used to be found throughout the forests of the South Island. So in the 1840s, that's where we think they were. Um, by the 1960s, they were still widespread, but you see they disappeared from Stewart Island and they disappeared from this, the beach gap here and all the coastal stuff that's been turned into farmland they've gone from, but they were still widespread, there were still more who in the Marlborough Sounds, you know, and so things were looking okay in the 60s, but then, say 2012, maybe I should have changed it to 2013, doesn't matter, about now, where are they? Well, there's, there's perhaps less than 50 birds in North Canterbury, they're, they're really on really on the edge of North Canterbury. Um, and there's the, the Landsborough, the Dart, and Eastern Fjordlands, the really big stronghold. And there's a few, like the Catlins, that's another big stronghold. But they're, they're now really, they've become southern birds, but they never used to be. And our, the strongholds for them are, are this neck of the woods. So they're an important beast around here. If we don't do anything, this is what we're going to end up with. We're going to have them on the islands we've stuck them on. So they're on codfish, ulva, um, chalky, anchor, break sea, rezo, secretary. Um, have we missed any? Pomona. Pomona, Pomona yep. Um, they're going to go put on blue mine in the sound soon. But, but so that, that would, that'll ensure that these things don't become extinct. But in, in terms of a conservation success story, ending up with them on a bunch of tiny islands that we can't visit is a pretty crap solution in, in my book. So why have they done so badly? Well, the, the simple answer is that rats and stoat eat, eat them. So no big surprise in that. But um, the silly thing they do is nest in holes. So you, you imagine the story. You imagine if you're an ordinary, a little bird that like a fantail that nests in the branches on a tree. So you're at this is a branch and this is where the fantail nests out here. And, and a stoat or rat comes along and it walks out the branch. Well, you detect it coming. Either you see it coming, or the branch wobbles, and the adult flies away. So the, the stoat or the rat or the possum or whatever gets the eggs and chicks, but the adults are fine. And, and chicks and eggs turn out to be not that valuable. It's adults that really matter. Killing adults is, is a bad thing. But when you nest in a hole, um, of course you don't see it coming until the face of the baddie is, is looking down on you and it's too late. You aren't getting out because you've got to go out through the hole he's coming in. So hole nesting it was, is a terrible thing to do. And there's a whole suite of New Zealand birds that are hole nesters. and, and and this, there was a logic in it in the days before there were mammals, because um, when, when the main predators were birds that hunt by sight, hiding 
was a damn good idea. So going in a hole hid you. But now the main predators hunt by smell. And going in a hole is a really stupid idea because the hole actually virtually concentrates the smell, probably makes it worse. So it was a, it, nesting in a hole is a dumb idea these days, but it was a good idea once. And the other thing that these things do wrong is only the females incubate. So when you lose a whole lot of birds, it's females you lose. It'd be much better if you lost 50-50 because it takes much longer to recover from all those, those girls being killed. And this female incubating seems to be a bit of a feature of whole nesters. So you think about it, um, the parakeets and kaka, whole nesters, and it's the females that do all the, the nest work. And then kakapo are the same, it's the females that are on the nest. So it would be better if they didn't do that. Now to understand how the, the whole moor who have suffered so much, you need to understand the, the beech forest predator-prey cycle, which you're probably all familiar with, but nonetheless I'll tell it to you all over again. Um, so every two to six years beech trees flower and then seed. So this is a mountain beech here with its flowers on. And pretty much every time the beech trees produce a decent amount of seed, the mice numbers go through the roof. And that's because the mice eat the seed. And they also eat, there's a, there's a big flush of insects come with the seed and the flowers, obviously, because it's good tucker. So the mice eat the seeds and all that other stuff. And you get heaps of mice. And then a few months later, the stoats, which can only breed once a year, do really, really well. And there's a pile of stoats and the stoats eat the dicky birds. So they eat mohua and they also eat kakas, kiwis, fio, parakeets, the works. Now it's a little more complicated that because once every now and then, and there's all sorts of reasons why this might be, and some of them we're not sure of, but not every time the beech trees seed, but some of the time the beech trees seed, you get a big plague of rats. Maybe it's every 10 to 20 years. I'm not sure of that, haven't lived long enough. Um, and those rats, um, they provide extra food for the stoats, so presumably the stoats do even a little bit better than they would have if they'd only had mice to eat. But then the rats are also predators, so you've now got two predators, stoats and rats, in huge abundance. So the story goes that once every two to six years, average of three and a half, you have a, a mouse plague and a bit of a stoat plague. And then less often, perhaps every 10 to 20 years, you get one of these super-duper um, rat and stoat plagues combined and that's when you when you get real damage done to your forest birds. So I'm going to have a whole lot of graphs come up and they're all going to look something like this so you might as well familiarise yourself. I've got years time along the bottom so I've got a timeline along there and up on the left I've got abundance of something. In this case it's mohua and other times it's going to be rats or stoats. So let's imagine you start off with a, a high number of of um, mohua. Mm -hmm. So if you start off with a high number of mohua and then let's say you have one of these stoat plagues that happen every three or four years, the mohua crash because they get eaten and they don't produce many babies in that year but then they'll recover in the years between and then they'll, in a the three or four years time there'll be another stoat plague that goes like that. But the catch is that for these stoat plagues most of the time even though they recover they never get back to quite where they were before. So over a longer period of time it starts to look like this, so just sort of the sawtooth decline. So we're just talking about stoats at the moment. So if you if you put in um, some stoat trapping, so you started stoat trapping, um, you can deal with those stoat plagues. We've done this; it works. And so if stoats are the only problem, just laying on the trapping, your birds will recover um, just fine. And that's been done on a few occasions, but the only trouble was stoats aren't the only problem. You've still got this rat issue. Um, so this is how the, the little rat, if you add the rat and the stoat story together, this is what you get. So each one of these is one of these little stoat plagues, and they're causing this gradual decline. Um, but it's the combined stoat and rat plagues that really make the difference. And you have these big crashes. And we saw that... Um, in this neck of the woods in 99-2000 when we had a catastrophic decline in, um, well, mohua in this neck of the woods. And that happened throughout the South Island. There were huge declines in mohua in the Arthur's Pass country, that North Canterbury country. That's when they went from having several hundred or maybe even a few thousand birds there down to just a few tens of birds. And the population on Mount Stokes in the Marlborough Sounds was completely wiped out. <coughs> when I did my PhD, 
D in the 80s, I observed one of those stoat plagues and, and, and I made up that story, if you like, about the sawtooth decline and I was going stoats, 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 they're causing a gradual decline and, and so we focused on stoats. We were going flat out on stoats and then this rat plague came along and actually caught us quite by surprise. Mind you, up until then, people were saying too that stoats weren't an issue too, weren't they? Or so well, some places, they, yeah, they may not have been, yeah. yeah so that sort of turned Anyway, so that's sort of where we're at now. So we have these combined stoat and rat plagues. I suspect in some places um, that th these, the mohawk can probably actually put up with those stoat plagues and they can probably just about hang in there, but they can't, they, they can't put up with those rat plagues. So, um, so one way you might think about handling this is just to do stoat trapping. And so I'll, I'll try and explain this. So if you just do stoat trapping, we're going to get rid of each of these little stoat only declines, right? And then when we get a rat plague come along, okay, we won't do anything about the rat plague because we're just dealing with the stoats, but maybe the population's got so big and healthy from getting rid of all these stoat plagues that it'll be okay. You know, they'll do a big drop, but they won't go extinct. And they'll, they'll continue on and with a big sawtooth. And, and I thought initially that might be one way of handling it, but um, then I've got the impression that that's not what happens, that if you do continuous stoat trapping, I reckon the rat plagues become more frequent or at least more problematic. And this is a bit, the evidence for this isn't, isn't startlingly good, so I'll run through you know, why I think this is the case. And, um, so if you imagine you've got, um, so this is another one of my little graphs, time along the bottom, rat abundance up here. Let's say you start off with hardly any rats at all, so you can't, you can't even tell they're there practically. Um, and let's imagine you've got a, a, I'll call it a detection threshold. This is, so you've got tracking tunnels out there, but it, it, if you've got rats less than that dotted line, chances are you won't even detect them on a tracking tunnel. So rats at this level, there's a few rats there, but you really can't tell they're there. Okay, and then we have a we have a beach seed fall. Now, when you have a beach seed fall, what happens is, um, and we've got lots of evidence from this now, is the rats, which usually don't breed in the winter, breed all winter, and they go flat out. And their reproductive rate during those winters when there's seed on the ground is about as much as you can achieve with a rat. Um, so, so it turns out to be just a little bit over one percent increase per day, which is just phenomenal. And We've, we've sort of measured that increase and we compared with what we thought rats could theoretically do by figuring out how often they can have babies and how, how many babies they typically have. And it's about the same. So it sort of suggests that during those winters there's, they breed as often as they possibly can. Most of their babies are, are surviving and there's very little mortality amongst the ad adults and they just rot it away. Now when the seed germinates somewhere around November, December. Most of it suddenly disappears. It doesn't quite all germinate, but 80 or 90% of the seed germinates, turns into tiny little beech trees, and most of which die. But so the seed disappears. So the rats rocket up here, and when they get to there, they're kind of stuffed, but it's summer. So they're not all gonna die, because rats do good in summer, and they also do quite well in autumn, because there's a lot of the other seeds and stuff are coming on. So we've seen this pattern of it roughly, it's not dead flat line, it's sort of all over the place, but during this summer period they do okay and then sometime in the winter they crash. And the timing of the crash varies from year to year. And I, I remember one year in the Dark Valley we were monitoring it and the crash happened, was, uh, I think it was in July, and it was one of those periods where it rained and snowed and then it cleared and froze. And so the valley stayed just rock solid for a, a week or two and all the rats just disappeared out of the system. And you can sort of imagine how it could happen. But the timing of that crash varies. But anyway, that's not really what I was going to talk about. So if you started off with rats undetectable, and you have a bit of a rat plague, and they become detectable. But if, if you can imagine this is a damage threshold, so this is the point at which it starts to matter to things like mohawk and parakeets. So they became detectable, but it didn't matter. There were a few rats in the system, who cares? So when that happens, and this probably happens almost every time the beach seeds, you probably get a little increase in rats that you can hardly detect. But now, if we bump up the number of rats at the beginning by a little bit, now we can do this, I think, by, I think taking the stoats out of the system probably allows for a minuscule increase in the, um, in the rat abundance. 
But the other thing we do is, in almost all the valleys where we do stoke control, we also do possum control. And there's increasing evidence that taking possums out of the system provides more food for the rats. So you end up with a, a little increase in, in rats down here. Now, it's still way below your detection threshold, you don't know they're there, but it's four or five times as many rats. You know, instead of having one rat in every thousand hectares, you've got four rats in every thousand hectares. And because populations grow exponentially when things are good, that tiny increase there leads to a, a big increase here. So if this was four times as great here, then it would be four times as great there. So I, I th there's sort of a lot. That's a logical explanation for why I think doing the stoke and possum control leads us to having bigger rat problems. It's the the possum and stoke control doesn't have any impact on this phase of it, but it just has this tiny impact at the beginning. Now, um, so that, that's sort of that's mostly theoretical. Um, there's, there is good evidence. Landcare has done some work to show that rats do increase when you get rid of um, possums, but the stoat um, rat thingy isn't isn't. We haven't got such good evidence for that. Um, there's some some data which I've just put up here. So this is rat abundance up this side, and we've got um, a couple of years of rat tracking from the. Nelson Lakes area, and so this is the red lines, Rotowiti, mainland island, where we're doing intensive stoat and rat control, and the rats are completely out of control, in fact. I mean, this 45% up here is um, completely intolerable rat level in that forest. But in Rotorua, which is nearby, where nothing happens, there's no pest control at all, the rats have stayed low. Um, so the rat control is not... It's not good rat control. Well, the, it's very, rat. well, it's experimental rat control. So, in fact, the rat control, and it hasn't worked, but mm. that's fine, you know, because they're yeah. just trying something out. But I think the point I want to make is with the other pest control, they're, which they're doing very good possum and stoat control there, um, it just looks like things are out of control to me. And, like, they asked if they could put more hoa in that mainland island a few years ago, and we said, well, let's have a look at your rat tracking rates, and you just go, oh, no way, this is a waste of time. They wouldn't last five minutes. So in fact, I was expecting to see more rats in the Rotoroa block because it goes. there's a little bit of podocarp forest right down by the lake at Rotoroa, which there's no podocarps at all in the Rotoiti one. So this is percentage in tracking tunnels? Tunnels, that yeah. And now there's another bit of, there's a couple of other bit of evi evidence for this um, notion that getting rid of the uh, stoats and possums makes things worse for the rats. and. Um, a few, it was probably about 10 years ago, there was a rat tracking study done through, throughout New Zealand where they just were sort of trying to learn about rat tracking. It was a bit of a novel thing at the time. And they compared rat tracking rates in, in pest controlled and non pest controlled forests. And there were, there were more rats in the pest controlled forest than the non pest controlled forest. Um, so, anyway, in that study, there were more rats in the treated forest and non-treated forest, but there was all sorts of other things going on there because throughout the whole country there was a whole pile of different forest types involved, so in, you know, it's not terribly compelling. And then my colleague Josh Kemp did a, um, he, was, he was looking at the efficacy of 1080 con operations for controlling rats in Golden Bay and they had four operations where they monitored rats in them. Two had had previous treatment, two hadn't, and we had lower rat numbers in the forest that had never never been treated before and had no ongoing pest control. So it's a building picture. Um, I, I couldn't say I was absolutely sure the explanation was true, but I'm fairly convinced it is. And I suppose the other thing is with this is that even, even if getting rid of the stoats and possums doesn't make the rat problem worse, we know that ignoring the rats, leaving them behind, is a recipe for disaster. So uh, the Mount Stokes was the classic um, illustration of that. On Mount Stokes a small population of moorhaw was rediscovered and at the time, and that was in the days when, because uh, when, I had told everybody stoat, 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 so we put in a stoat control program on Mount Stokes and the population just rocketed away and we got from about 15 birds it went up to about 100 and we were thinking, you know, this is great and then we had a rat plague and they're gone so um, I don't know whether the stoke plague, the stoke control, made it any worse, but nonetheless, you can't ignore rat plagues. If you deal, if you deal, if you want small forest birds, you've got to deal with the rats as well. Graham, are these rat plagues occurring in all forest types? Do you think, from what we've seen, like 
Is it mostly red beach sort of dominated systems or is it everything? I think it's everything, but I think in the red beach dominated systems they're just a heap worse. So those, um, we've had a few um, rat plagues in the Catlins and there's no red beach there. And in, in the very highest altitude parts of the Catlins, the, the rats don't get very high at all. In the low altitude parts, they do a bit better. And the Blue Mountains, you know, same story. There's no red beach in the Blueies. It's all just silver beach. Um, no pest control of any kind. Oh, the possums get killed in there. Um, but they're sort of hanging in there without, without much intervention. And I suppose the Landsborough's the other one. Landsborough's got no red beach. That's all just silver beach. They've had one rat plague, but that, that rat plague, which they had recently and did a 1080 operation to deal with, on, on the scale, talking in Eglinton terms, that wasn't a rat plague. It was a, you know, the maximum tracking rate was, I don't know what it was, I think it was 17%. Whereas, I can't remember what their maximum from the Eglinton is, but I know our maximums from the DART get up as high as 80%. So they are very small rat plagues in those forests. What about mixed polycarp beach forests? Well, I think, I'm sort of, what I think, I know there's good evidence for this as well, is, is um, if you're in a forest where there's a masting species, so say it's a, um, oh, a southwestern Lemu forest, is especially near the coast, is um, when there's a beach, when there's a Lemu mast or a beach mast, the rats go up and then they drop down again. But they don't drop down to zero because near the coast there's a whole lot of coastal things, you know, there's kiki, there's, well, you know, it's always richer near the coast. So especially near the coast, it'll drop down and it levels off at about 20% instead of dropping down to damn near zero in the beach forest. So I think in the beach forest we get these bigger fluctuations going from sort of 80 down to zero and in those uh, like southwestern podocarp forests it's fluctuating between maybe zero, uh, 20% and 80%, you know, it's just... So in a way we, we sort of get these huge spikes in the beach forest but it, that's a positive because what happens is in between the big spikes they go to damn near zero and the reason why we've still got Mohor in places like the Eglinton is because they did go down to zero and the birds got a respite between the, the big plagues whereas in those well in North Island protocarp forest those patterns are even are almost impossible to discern because you haven't just got beech or rima you've got a whole suite of other podocarps and he now and tar and all that stuff. So there's no great masting pattern in, in North Island podocarp for us. It's just you know all over the place. But you know, just the Eglinton in '99. If that sort of event had been happening since shipwrecks have been in New Zealand, say, like even without soap control, there, there must have been mm. massive beach masting events for the last hundred years or so. Mm. And the impact on what were in that big beach. Yeah. Sort of two in a row. yeah, I've often wondered, Murray, because I'm feeling the same. It just seems that they wouldn't have survived this long. Oh. Well, look, the, the only explanation I can come up for that is, as I think, you know, when I when I was in Eglinton in the early '80s, there were lots of moorhorn on the valley floor, but they went right up to the tree line. And we know that in each of those beach masts, the the rat problems are greatest in the valley floors. You know, we've got good evidence for that now. So I think we sort of, so we, we kill all the moho in the valley floors and there's a few stragglers left around, this is just a story by the way, but there's a, there's a few stragglers left around the tree line and, um, and then of course those stragglers around the tree line, well that was, I, I know this for a fact, that like the ones on the valley floor used to stick with the territory year after year after year after year and you could find a bird, well there was the one bird, the longest lived moho that we know of who was who I banded and then he died 14 years later or disappeared 14 years later and he'd moved probably three or four hundred meters it was staggering how far he'd gone <laughs> they they know they're onto a good thing in the valley floor and they stay there but I monitored a few pairs of more who are up the hill and between years they moved because their the piece of dirt they'd picked on wasn't worth having anyway so next year they'd go somewhere else so okay, he, so the story goes that every time there's a bad mast, we suck all the ones out of the valley floor where the rat plagues were worse. We kill them all. The one, a few survive around the tops, but they're not stupid, so they come down to the valley floor. And then the numbers build up again, and we keep on doing this. So we keep on sucking them out of the out of the the crap country round. And then after you've done that three or four times, you'll do it once, and there's nobody left up high. 
And I think that may be where we've got to. And of course, there used to be. We've, we, I've got this picture in my mind of Moho being these valley floorbirds, but they used to be everywhere. So what sort of height are you talking about? Like thousand metres? Well, I suppose probably above the Red Beach line, actually. So the Red Beach gives you the good country, and then the other stuff up the slopes is. Um, anyway, that was a diversion. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so so okay, we've got to the point where we've got to worry about both stoats and rats. So with Moho, um, um, I'll talk about the Dart Valley where we've had a, had a crack at this. So we started off in 2003 with hardly any rats, and then we had a, a seed fall in 2004, and it did something like the pattern that I've described, um, and they declined away again. But um, notice that at the end of that period of in, in high rat numbers, we didn't get quite big get back to where we were before and so then, then when we had another beach seed fall they started to rise dramatically and by this stage because this was after all the disasters in Eglinton so we we're a bit primed to this now and we thought crikey you know with that rate of increase we're going to take a pasting so we had a whole pile of bait stations out there and we filled them up with bradyphacoon and we got this little pause and then it went um, and then it just went away again now, I don't, this is not an anti-bait station thing, it's going to be an anti-bridifacoom um, bit of talk. So that putting those bridifacoom in the bait stations just plain didn't work. Um, and then, in a bit of a panic, we did a 1080 operation. Um, I think Barry got the thing together in five weeks, which must be a bit of a world record for getting it. Um, and it knocked the um, rats for six. And we had a control block um, nearby, Mill Flat. I don't know if you know, it's near Lake Diamond. Um, the, more, the rat numbers just kept on going up, and, and Mill Flat, the more who disappeared. And um, as far as we could tell, in the other bit, we couldn't detect any impact of rats on the population at all. So um, the, the 1080 worked really well, um, kept the rats to a low enough number that, that was, there's little or no impact, but without it, we were screwed. And we were very curious to know why didn't the Bradyphacoon work, and we've come up with a story which is, once again, hard to be sure of, but we think it's because... Um, rats prefer takeaways. So, so um, Bradyphacoom is a bit of a nasty poison that accumulates in the environment. So when we use it, the department insists we tie it into our bait stations so it can't be removed. So if a rat wants to eat Bradyphacoom, he's got to sit with his head in the bait station and his bum out in the open air. And you could understand he might not want to do that. So if there's a whole lot of food lying around outside, which is the beach seed, why on earth would you stick your head in a bait station? Um, so if you'd replaced that bradyphacoon with another bait that they could take away, and uh, you've been using pindone a lot, haven't you, um, Lindsay? So if you, some of the other poisons that the department hasn't got rules about tying them in probably work fine. And, and certainly if you, if you broadcast 1080 all over the ground, they're happy to pick it up even when there's beach seed there. But I think also, even if there's beach seed outside and you give them a poison that they can take home, they're happy to eat that as well. But there was a lesson in that, so that was the wrong poison for that occasion. Well, I'm just going back to that original um, program just before with the dark, that one. So after, the, after you did the 1080 drop, I would have assumed that that would have gone down flat. Why did it do that again? Yeah, well, I don't know. We've seen that a few times. Um, often it does just go... So we've done quite a few 1080 ops now with, um, with rats like this, and often they go bang down. I suspect it's because we didn't do as good a job as we might have. So, I mean, there's a bit of noise in these tracking tunnel results. So if you, if you get a zero and the next one's a 6%, it probably means that you've really probably got two threes, and they're, they're just not all that accurate. So I would sort of take that to mean that we got them down to about... 5%, we didn't get them down to zero. So what happened after that? Um, well, after that, the the rats crashed sometime in the winter here, and so these ones just crashed out as well. But that's, I mean, that's what was going to happen anyway. Yeah. And I think that was probably there when I talked about that cold winter, I think. so. And, and that dying off in the winter almost invariably happens in these higher altitude places and it's somewhere between June and November. It's quite variable but they seem to just disappear from the system. So if you think about using um, so n I'm just now imagining what so we didn't do stoke control with the traps, what so we just use aerial 1080 or not aerial 1080 or just any other 
rat poison and bait stations, if we just focused on using that and tried not to use the stoke traps, I think, I think it would work. Um, so is what you do, is, is everybody happy with this graph? These are the, the, little, the little stoke plagues and here's the, the big rat plague. Now if you use 1080 or, or poison and bait stations here, um, you eliminate that big crash, so in fact you get these two periods of growth one after the other, so the population rocks away. And so with that model, doing some sort of rat control every time there's a big rat plague, you maybe don't need to do anything else. For more, oh water. for more water. Yeah, it's very important. <laughs> I'm going to get to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you've, so you've got this model. If you just worry about more water, you could perhaps forget the stoats and just deal with the rats. But you can't do it the other way around. You can't just deal with the stoats and forget about the rats. But there, there's another important thing in this is that um, you've got to get it right. If you did your 1080 op or your bait station op in the wrong year, it's no bend for the door because nothing was going to happen anyway. So you've got to get, you've got to know when to do it. <laughs> it's essential. Oh, I wish I could remember what I was going to talk about here. <laughs> oh, yeah, what about, so that's sort of, so it's important to get the timing right to coincide with the, the, those rat plagues. But what about within the year? So go back to the story, beach seed fall, the germination, rat population grows, then sort of stabilises and then crashes. If you... One of the things we found recently, which has been a, a bit of a breakthrough, if you do a 1080 op or any other kind of rat control at the peak, just before, it, just as it levels off, there's, there's almost no recovery. Because what's happening is during this phase, well, but hang on, I'll do the next one. But if you do your, your rat control here, there's, a, there's this period of recovery. Because while the rats are breeding and sending out lots of babies, there's rats dispersing all over the planet. But once they stop breeding and there's not a whole... It's the young ones that do the dispersing. So once they stop breeding and there's hardly any young rats around any longer, they stop dispersing and there's, so there's not much migration coming in. So if you do it then, you eliminate this whole period of when there would have been high rats there and there's almost no recovery. If you do it then, there is a period of recovery and you'll have rats through you know, moderate numbers of rats through that long period there, and you're sort of going, well, I don't know which is the best thing to do. Mm. And so, so mm. let's imagine you've got a nesting bird, and this is approximately when moorhawk nests, and so they moorhawk, they nest from November to February. Well, if you did that one, well, it's not bad, but you've, you've left your birds exposed, they're most vulnerable while they're nesting, you've left your birds exposed for that bit, and it's not that flash. Mm. If you did the sort of this is kind of a nip it in the bud approach, try and get the things out of it before they're causing problem, but in fact they'll probably recover and there'll be moderate numbers of rats right through the whole breeding season and you go, well, that doesn't look very flash either. So maybe this would be the best approach. So you do your, I've got teenagers in all these because I prepared these for other things, but it doesn't matter what it is. You do your rat control here, you start doing it just as they start nesting. There's a little bit of recovery in there for a month or so, and then it levels off, and that's probably, for moorhawk, that's probably the best solution. But the story's slightly different for every bird you're worried about, and well, every bird and bat, and lizard for that matter. So it's, it's painfully complicated. <laughs> so we'll just keep on trundling along. So sort of, now I want to talk about sort of timing, going back to a slightly bigger scale. So if you're, if you're worried about rat and stoat sensitive, and I'm going to call them small dicky birds, because you know, you know what I mean, they're the the moorhawks, the robins, the riflemen, fantails, grey warblers, all those birds that are very sensitive to both rat and stoats. And okay, the beech trees, at the risk of being monotonous, the beech trees flower in the spring and early summer, the seed falls in the autumn, and the seed lies around on the ground until it germinates. And then the rats go, same old pattern, the rats do that. They increase until it germinates and they eventually crash. The stoats can't breed all year, but they have a really good breeding season in the summer, so you get a big, you get a five-fold increase in stoats during the summer, and then maybe even the next summer you get a bit more of a blip, but that's perhaps not so important. But it's important that possums are relatively unaffected by this. I've exaggerated this a bit. Possums do do a bit better when there's a bit of seed around, but I think, roughly speaking, we can say that the possums are pretty much unaffected by the beech seed fall. They just go straight through. So and how does this affect our mohua? Well, more who aren't badly affected by possums. Their holes are too small for po most possums to get in, so they're probably okay. Um, and when rats and stoats 
are low, they do fine. So you have good breeding. And the next year you have poor breeding, and we know that that poor breeding can sometimes be disastrous, not just poor. And then the year after it looks like it's okay, because you still got a bit of residual um, stoat and rat stuff, and then you go back to good again. So that's the pattern we've got for more water. So if we do our pest control, our rat control with either bait stations or 1080, and we do it there, we knock the possums for six, the stoats and the rats for six, remember, um, if you use 1080, for example, possums are killed by 1080, and stoats are killed through secondary poisoning. They eat mice and rats that have taken the bait. It's a bit of the same story with bait stations, is that the, I think the stoats are killed by secondary poisoning from bait station use as well. So if you did that, you're, you'd have a good, every year would be a good year for more horse. So that's, that solution of just doing pest control then should be great for more horse. What about a pheo? And there's a whole lot of species that probably fall into the same camp, kia, pheo, and kiwis. So we've got all that stuff again. Now these birds um, have pretty unsuccessful breeding most years because it takes them a long time to raise their, well, particularly um, kia, it takes them a long time to raise their babies, they're noisy and smelly and all that kind of stuff. So even when stoats and rats aren't that common, they don't do well. Um, some of them are badly, like um, possums get into kia nests. I know you recorded some possums getting into pheo nests, didn't you, Murray? But they didn't do anything, I think. Just harass them. Yeah, just harass them. Can't be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so they don't do very well anyway. They presumably do worse in these years, and then they go back to that. <laughs> so if you did, um, so if you did your pest control then, and you killed possums, stoats, and rats in that year. Same old pattern. You presumably get good breeding that year, and you might get good breeding, well, you almost certainly get good breeding the following year. Whoops. And maybe you'd still have the poor breeding either side, but for these species, a couple, <coughs> of, a couple of good years out of every four might be enough, because perhaps except for Theo, they're not killing many of the adults, they're just getting the babies. So, so that'll work for these dudes. But these are the these are real bugger carcass. They really mess up my whole my whole plan, really. Okay, the story again. You know, carcass only nest every three or four years in beech forest. They nest in synchrony with the beech seeding. They start laying when the beech trees are flowering in anticipation of the seed which is going to come when they're feeding their chicks. Um, they take ages to raise their chicks, and the nest gets smelly, and the chicks are noisy. So it's really easy to find a carcass nest. And so, even when stoats are low, that's not a low, no, no, low enough number of stoats. And of course, the possums, we've, we've, possums are regular predators of carcass nests, and they do kill some carcass on the nest. So, it's pretty grim. So, <laughs> yeah. so, they breed then, they mostly do appallingly. Okay, so if we did the sort of pest control I advocated for those other species, and we did it to get rid of the big spike in stoats and, and rats, wouldn't make any bloody difference to these things because we could still have high numbers of possums and stoats while they were breeding. So for these dudes, we might want to bring our pest control back to here, get rid of the possums, the stoats and rats. The rats don't matter for these dudes, it's really just the possums and the stoats. They're too big for rats. So that would work. Graham, I think <coughs> even for Theo too, mm. you know, you'd lose a lot of females yeah. every year, Good. whether they were stoat babies yeah, or not. Yeah. I don't think one one or two would do. I did some sums on the um, data that Amy had from you know a few years oh, ago, yeah, yeah. and I reckon maybe two out of three years might just about scrape through, but it was pretty marginal. Mm. I think you're right, Murray. For Theo, you probably just about need to do the stoke trapping the whole time. I think you could probably get away with two out of three or four for the Kias and the Kiwis, perhaps. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not losing those females. Not losing so many. Well, you lose a few um, female. Um, Kias, but not a heap. Okay, so anyway, if you did this, what well, if you did this for the carcass, um, how would it go for the moorhaw? Well, not that flash, because you'd still be having a rat and a stoke plague a year later. Um, so a carcass solution's not really going to work for moorhaw, and how would it go for something like Theo? Well, they'd have a good year then, this year would be pretty bad, and then these ones would be going back to bed. So you'd only be getting one year out of three. So, it, so the carcass solution is not going to work for much else. So where do we get to? So our preferred design at the moment with the technology and what we know is that we do 
stoke traffic right through, we accept that that might cause more rat problems um, than we would have had to put up with otherwise, but we deal with the rat problems when they come up. So we have no stokes because of the stoke trapping, and we deal with the possums and rats with other control methods, either 1080, doing them both at once, or bait stations and maybe some possum, ground-based possum control, something like that. So that's sort of where we've got to now, is that's our, for most of these valleys, that's what we do. Continuous stoke trapping and pulsed rat and maybe possum control. Um, and if you do that, um, the stoke, and we well, have low numbers of possums because you've, of your occasional possum control, and um, you have low numbers of stoats, so your carcass will do fine, and everything else will do fine as well. So that's sort of become our best practice for pest control in beech forests. That's what we're doing these days. Um, now, so if you do everything, if you do possums, stoats, and rats, if you kill them all through using something like that, you can have you can have more. You can have carcass, pheo, robins. Your mistletoes will be okay because you've got rid of all the possums. Your long tail bats will be okay because the rats are controlled and the stoats. You can have kakariki will be unaffected. Bellbirds and tuis and things will be abundant. That's the cedar, they are badly affected by um, possums, they'll be fine. So I was just trying to build up a big picture of what the things you might be able to have. So that's, you can have fuchsia, you'll control the possums, the fuchsia will be good. Southern rata will be good and you can have your kiwis. That's a great spot of kiwis, sorry. Wrong kiwi for down here. <laughs> um, but if you don't do the rats, if you leave the rats out of it because you think it's too hard, you, well, you're not going to have more whore. You're not going to have robins, probably. You won't. Your long-tailed bats are at great risk. And parakeets at great risk. And the tuis and bellbirds will be okay, but our experience is that with, without good pest control, you get a hell of a lot less of them. So you'd have um, fewer tuis and bellbirds. So if you do the lot, if you do possums, stoats, and rats properly, you can have everything. So, so okay, how, how, how do you know when you're going to get a bad rat year? <laughs> so, um, so this pattern we've been seeing ad nauseum. So we get the beach flowering here. So I've, this graph, we've gone back a bit in time. So beach flowering in the previous spring and summer, whenever it occurs. It's a bit variable depending on the altitude you're at, so I don't know if I've got that right for here. And then the beach seed fall starts in March the beach germinates in and we've got the rats in there. Okay, so that's what normally happens and, and maybe, so this would lead to rat control with timing something like that. Remember I had the nesting birds in here, so that, that might be the right thing to do. But the trouble is, um, sometimes it does that. So you've got, a, you've got a bit of the beach forward, you know it's coming and the rat numbers start to creep up, but I think they eat all the seed basically, there wasn't much of it and they crash away. So. And it makes it, if, if that happened, well, there'd be no point spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on this rat control because nothing was going to happen anyway. This didn't really matter. So you've got to know that it's coming. And, and oh, hang on. Well, going back to this, like if we end up doing our rat control in October, November, say, in a docky perspective, and probably almost for anybody, you need a bit of advance, you've got to order baits, you've got to arrange staff, you've got to do a bit of business planning to make sure you've got the cash in your pockets when you need it. So you need as much advance warning of this as you can possibly get. So, the beach flowering gives you a bit of a tweak, so um, we must have all seen it from town now, steer over the hills and there's just pollen bloody everywhere, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's probably a pretty good heads up. And, Nobody's formalised the pollen bloody everywhere thing, but we probably could. And so that gives you, when you see pollen everywhere on the other side of the lake, that's saying to you, hey, in a year's time, we might need to be um, <coughs> doing something. And if you don't see any pollen and no flowering, well, so if you do see some pollen, it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen, but it means it might. But if you don't see any pollen, it ain't going to happen. So you want to keep your eye out for the pollen on the other side of the lake. And we've been trying to formalise this with, um, we've tried things like, well, people have suggested satellite telemetry, see if you can actually see the red, the red on the trees um, from above. Um, or what else could you do? Well, you, I think you can probably um, take samples from the trees, either shoot or cut samples down and, and cut the buds open and you can see that they're flowering buds, not just growing buds. 
I've tried to set up a system of going around and looking for the flowers, but the catch is the flowering time is a bit variable. So if you want to catch it, you've got to go out day after day after day. So maybe the idea of cutting some samples off and looking for the buds would, would be a good trick. But anyway, it's not a crisis if you don't see the beach flowering. There's the beach seed fall, which happens in the winter. You can collect the beach seed fall and count it. It turns out it's a pain in the bum. It's, it's a big job to collect and count it. But nonetheless, that gives you another... I think I had it. Yes. Had it flashing. So the beach seed fall gives you another indication of earlier. But the real crunch for determining these things is, is monitoring rats. So we typically we monitor rats four times a year, in Nove um, well May, August, November, February. And for this stuff, the May and the August rat monitors are crucial. So if you so you do your rat monitoring here with tracking tunnels, probably. But you can see, even in May, when you're going to have a big problem, you've still got quite low numbers of rats. And you might, so if, if it turned out when you did a tracking tunnel monitor in, in May, if you had something like 7 or 8% rats, that would say, crikey, you're about to take a pasting. They'll go through the roof. So if you've got a high number of rats, you'd know to go from May, provided you had some seed around. But if you've got a low number of rats in May, say you only got 1 or 2%, you'd still be scratching your head. You still couldn't be confident in May that you were really going to need to hit those rats. But by August, you can tell. But the catch is by August, you've only got a, a month or two to prepare for your operation. So you sort of, so we sort of go through this process of um, gearing ourselves up with these, saying if these indicate we might have a, a problem, we start to do the planning, you know, get if it's 1080 you need resource consents and you need to order bait and you, obviously if it's brown based stuff you need to order bait as well. So that's the way we do it, we tell them to get planning but the call whether to do it or not actually comes in August from that, um, from that rat tracking. So that system we've got wor working at those Operation Arc sites around the country and that's sort of, oh well, it has hiccups, it's, it's bureau bureaucratic and, but it kind of works. <laughs> So what's your percentage um, in August that you get concerned about? Well, I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, you can, it's easy to do the sums because we can make quite good predict... Because this growth rate here is so predictable, you can just say, oh, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember what it is, but you can say if it's 10% you know, here, you're screwed. You know, if it's less than 10%, you might be OK. Mm -hmm. I'll give you, so most of them give you zero rats. Um, we had one in the Catlins. We had still had 5% rats afterwards, which we're pretty disappointed with because it's nice to do the zero. But in terms of the mohawk, it was fine, you know. Is there uh, any connection um, with overall climate patterns that can be established? Oh yeah, I, sh I should have said that. Good thinking. <laughs> yeah, there's um, there's been a bit of work done recently that shows. Well, we we always knew that beach seeding was triggered by warm summers. The year, so the year before this, sure, if it was a warm summer, that led to a, a higher likelihood of a beach seed fall. But it was pretty rough and you wouldn't have wanted to bet much money on it. But there's been some recent work done by a chap, Dave Kelly, at um, Canterbury University, and he's found out that it's not warm summers, it's the difference between two summers. So if you have a, if you have a warm summer and then a hot summer, and if that difference is greater than about one and, one and a half degrees, you know, the average temp summer temperature, then that's a pretty good predictor of a beach seed fall. So we have done that, so we're, even right now we're making these predictions for next year, but they're pretty hairy, you know, you've probably got a you know, one in three chance of getting it right, but w one thing that has come out of it, if it's colder, so if it's warmer, you might get a beach seed fall, worth getting heads up, but if it's colder, you won't. So you can turn it off, but it's not so good at turning it on. Because climate modelling is improving dramatically. Dramatically, yeah, yeah. And, um, so that's, that's been a little bit of a breakthrough, but it's still not a hell of a good predictor. So it just, it just like these all end up being heads up, because even if you have a beach flowering, that doesn't mean you're going to get a seed fall, because if the conditions on the days that the pollen is available are disgusting, well then you don't get much seed. And then even if you get a big seed fall, from what I was saying before, you don't necessarily get a rat plague, and, and I'm not quite sure, well, I've got some clues as to why. So you, you still have, these are all just heads up. It's this stuff particularly this one, that really matters. So I, I think of those climate predictions and the seed fall and the flowering as being sort of business planning helps, but the real management tools are that rat tracking. Right. Now I was just going to talk about a, um, a little experience we had in the DART a couple of years ago. Um, so this is the, um, the DART Valley, Lake, Lake Wakatipu, Queenstown, 
like town and out next to the woods. You all know where we are, so this is um, Lake Sylvan there, the route between tracks through there. Now, we knew in the past that um, if, if rats did this and got up to about 80%, that it was a disaster. Um, we also knew, <laughs> for more gore, they, they were just pasted. But we'd also done it in, um, we'd monitored a, a, a rat plague in the Catlins where it only got up to about 30%, and we couldn't detect much impact at all. So we had the situation where we know that if it's 80% we have to do something, if it's 30% we don't have to do anything at all. But there's some point in between, um, you know, that's that's kind of the critical point. And we didn't know where it was. And you don't want to do this stuff more than you have to because it's bloody expensive. So we were really keen to find out where this intermediate point might be that we could not control. So um, so this is the results, the, the tracking, rat tracking results we got in from um, from the DART. So when we did the May rat tracking result, the rat numbers were quite low, we had, there'd been a seed fall and when the rats were there, you know, they went zero, and we predicted on the basis of that that we were going to get to 39%. And we thought, well, 39% is greater than 30%, but it's not that much greater. It would be worth leaving this one um, to see if it's okay. And, uh, and if, if we do take a hit on the mortal, we don't imagine it's going to be an absolute killer, because it's not that much more than the 30%, which seemed to be okay. So, so we it was, um, so I'm telling you about a disaster, <laughs> but I want everybody to be aware that it was, it was a, we went into this disaster with our eyes wide open. So um, come August, we did another rat tracking, and it doesn't really matter what the tracking was, but we predicted then it got a bit worse, not, not much different, and that's 30, certainly within the amount of noise we expect in this system. It was now predicting 45%, and we're all going... Mm. But that should be fine, you know. And we did some careful sums. We reckon we might, we could at worst lose a third of our moor That wouldn't be catastrophic. And um, so we held to our, you know, stuck to it. But then what happened was, is that um, it went to about 45%. We got that right. But whereas in nearly every other operation that we'd monitored, they'd stayed roughly flat from there. On this one, kept on going. Um, and some of the blocks got up to, they all got up to over 60%, and some of them got up to 68%. And, um, and had we known that it was going to get that high at the start, we wouldn't have done the experiment. That's, that, that's getting too risky, but nonetheless, we we're, were, were, were there. So when we were doing this, we decided to put in a heap of monitoring, because we knew we were taking a gamble. So we monitored more or nesting success through this period, and we monitored more or survival through the whole period, we banded a whole lot of birds and went back and looked for banded birds, and we can estimate how many of them survived. And up until January, well, so well, the bad news is that we lost 75% of the birds. It was absolutely catastrophic what happened there. Um, it's, not, it's not as bad as what happened in Eglinton in 99-2000. I think with 25% of the birds will be fine as long as we look after them for the next 10 years. But it's pretty bad. But we did learn some other stuff because um, we monitored the nesting success and they nested, they, they only raised one clutch that year and, and they finished by January. And the nesting success was, and I've monitored nesting success a heap of times now in various places, the nesting success was 73%, which is the highest nesting success I've ever recorded for Morgul. And you're going, oh, well, there were all those rats there, how come they did so well? But then, sometime from then onwards, by when we came to do the um, Look for the band of birds in May, 75% of them disappeared. So it really looks to me like that um, in this period through here, when there's lots of food for the rats and the rat population is still growing, the rats don't tuck into the forest birds much. And it's this winter thing, I think that's what you were saying before, it's this winter mortality is the biggie. So when you get this high residual number of rats hanging around until that crash sometime in, you know, between June and November, that's when you take a pasting. So it's, when you think about the time of those operations, it's getting rid of all this stuff that matters. It seems that getting rid of this stuff is not so important. So, um, so there's a story from the, the, from the DART is that it was a disaster. We lost more birds than we had wanted to um, lose. And, I, and the message we've taken out of it is it's, I don't think we can afford to go hunting for that, that point somewhere between 30 and 80 anymore. 30 is it. <laughs> If we're predicting anything above 30, we should be in there. Um, 
that'll mean we're going to spend more money than we need to because I'm sure there is a point <laughs> in there but it's obviously there's too much noise in the system to get it right so we should just stick with our guns well, I mean if we had all the more who are back in the South Island you'd have the ability to actually probably fine tune that a bit yeah. it's the fact that we've got such few populations as Graham showed at the start that it is too risky at this point yeah so we just have to go for it okay so now I want to talk about a little bit about um, this neck of the woods. So this is our, the proposed stoat trapping network. It's going to look something like that. Um, that's 650 stoat traps, roughly, and 130 k's of tracks, I think. You know, and that's all very doable. It's been uh, very similar stuff's been done all over the place. It's fine. It's tiring, <laughs> but it's manageable. Now, if you wanted to do bait stations to deal with the rats over that whole block. Um, it would take 809, and, it's in the, and our standard for bait stations is about one a hectare for rats. Um, it would take 890 k's of tracks and you know a very large number of bait stations. And, and I've had a bit to do with um, trying to run bait station operations in some of the Canterbury Valleys, and, and I just don't think that's doable. Because <laughs> um, I don't think you can keep the staff up to it, is the big issue, because it's not nice work and they roll off. So, so you can. I think the experience in the Eglinton is you can probably do that kind of, you can do a big scale bait station operation in a nice easy environment, but as soon as you start going all over the place in the hills, I, think, I just don't think it's doable. It might be. But you could do it with 1080 operation. Um, an 8,900 hectare 1080 operation is incredibly ho-hum now, and for rats particularly, it um, gets very good results. So if we wanted to get rid of the, um, the rats when there was a rat plague in there, that would be the way that you could guarantee to do it over a big area. What would be the estimated cost, Graham, for Well, um, that's all in that, um, in that breakdown thing, yeah. yeah. So you do it for, f I it think... For, I think it was estimated for 11,000 hectares, it was about $7.50. A hectare. hectare. I, sort of, I, haven't, I haven't put the absolute cost up there. You've got, sort of got some relative costs now. If... I understand that you've already got the 460 hectares of bait stations in this bit, I think, is that right? And, yeah. then, uh, and there's plans to do the bait stations over that 2,000, well, it's yeah. about 3,000 hectares there. And to do that... Well, not really. No, it is not yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, but, but okay, well, we can uh, just talk about it. So if you wanted to do that with bait stations, um, that's getting more doable. You know, 3,000 hectares of bait stations, there's more bait stations than that up the Eglinton. It's doable, but it's still a lot. It's 275 kilometres of tracks, a pile of bait stations, nearly 3,000 bait stations. Um, and on a cost, cost wise, compared with what you do with 1080 to achieve the same thing, um, from the costings that, um, who prepared those for us? Um, M. M, the M prepared, you could, you could treat 6,000 hectares for about the same amount of bucks. <laughs> I mean, so there's all sorts of reasons why you want to, might want to use bait stations and not want to use 1080, but what you want to do is, you know, if you go into it with the eyes wide open, if you use bait stations, you're treating a smaller area than you would do if you use the other techniques that we've found to work in these places. Um, I, that's all I really wanted to say, but I, I sort of wanted to make a plug for big, because um, Fjordland's a monster of a place, and it's... One of the main reasons why it's special is because it's a monster. Um, things like FIO probably don't, except in the places where we look after them, things like FIO don't occur in any higher numbers than they do in, in anything like Kaharangi National Park, but the place is two or three times as big. So we've got more of them. The, the th there's just there's thousands of hectares of wilderness out there, and that's that's the thing that really grabs me about... Fiordland, and I sort of like the notion of climbing up to the top of Mount Luxmore, say, looking out to the west and going, this place is full of great stuff. Well, it ain't. It's full of nothing. You know, most of the birds that we value, the Fio and the Kiwis and the Mohawk, if they haven't gone already, they're heading, heading toward extinction. So if we do a little blob like that, that will be great for Tiana, <laughs> but it ain't great for Fiordland. And so it'd be nice to come up with a plan that even if we couldn't do a great gob now, it was something that we could expand to do a decent gob of it in the future. That, that's me.